about scripture in Jeremiah. God says, anything too hard for me? <laughs> Do we know the answer to that question? Kind of a rhetorical question. Well, no, <laughs> nothing's too hard. Well, y'all, welcome to No Limits. You chose to be at the best place on Sunday morning right here at No Limits. Go ahead and give your neighbor a high five and say, you made a good choice. If you're joining us online, you made a good choice too. Thanks for being with us. We're really glad that you're here. Uh, we're continuing our series today called God of Miracles. It's time for us to start seeing signs and wonders on the regular. God's always been willing to do it. We just have to learn how to cooperate. So that's what this series has been all about. But for those of you who don't know me, my name's Cade, and I'm the lead pastor here alongside my wife, Beth. And here at No Limits, we're on a mission of making a difference in the lives of others. We want to help people know God, find freedom, and what? Discover purpose. Good job, Sam. Way to kill it. In other words, we want to help you live the life that God planned for you before you were even born. It's a journey. You don't get there overnight. And you don't get there by yourself. So that's why we get together every Sunday. There is a purpose behind this. This isn't just a religious activity. We get together with a purpose. And we also get together in our small groups throughout the week for the same purpose, to build these relationships because we need them. The goal we're reaching for is found in Ephesians 3.20, which basically says that when we allow God's power to work in us, he's going to blow our minds with what he can accomplish through us. Really, as a group of believers, we won't get it there by ourselves. It's together that we accomplish that. So that's what we're after. That's why we're called No Limits Church. So go ahead and look at whoever you're with right now and say, it's time to take limits off, brother, sister. Do it. Well, this month we have the kiddos joining us here in service, and we have several of them right here in the front row. Hey, guys. This is intentional. And what we realized uh, a, a few months ago is that if you read the ministry of Jesus, the kids were kind of always around whenever he was out teaching and preaching and healing and doing all that kind of stuff. So I was like, huh, I think that they need to spend some time in here with us. And I think, I think it's great for them to have age-specific learning as well, but it's also great for them to be in here with us, getting closer to God together as a family. So, hey, kiddos, are you listening? Can you wave at me? I'm really glad you guys are here. We're really glad that you're here. With, like, everybody in this room is glad that you're here with us. So go ahead and, like, give an adult a big high five. Slap as many hands as you can. And then I told you, I told you, all, I told you kiddos this last week, but, you know, the adults in the room, they kind of have a hard time listening when there's a bunch of noise. So if we are extra quiet, like, it'll help them to pay attention in class. You think that we can do that? She's like, maybe, I don't know. I bet we can. That's, that's my challenge for you today. All right, let's get this message going. Many people believe that God withholds miracles. They think that he only dishes them out as he wants to, when he wants to, or when you've done everything perfect. Anybody done everything perfect in the room yet? So it's actually this kind of incorrect thinking that keeps us from seeing miracles. Like God, the miracles already existed. God already provided you protection. He's already provided you healing. He's already provided you provision. The only thing that keeps you from receiving the miracles, it's you. So the first thing, if we want to see miracles in our midst, signs and wonders on the regular, we have to stop blaming God and realize that we're the problem. Can somebody just like get, humble themselves and say, I'm the problem here? It's not God. So step one to see the miracle is we got to stop blaming God. He's not withholding these things, and he never will. And the core scripture for this series is found in Mark chapter 11. And in this chapter, Jesus gives us four things that we need to do to receive miracles. Aren't you glad he makes it plain for us? Let's read it again. It says, Then Jesus said to the disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it'll happen. But you must really believe it'll happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it'll be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone that you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. So in this short lesson from Jesus, he gives us four things. And they're all highlighted right there, but we can break them down like this. If you have your message notes out, message notes out go ahead and fill these in. The first one is have faith in God. Then you got to speak your faith, remove the doubt, and forgive others. And in the first week of the series, we talked about faith, 
And we found out that faith is it's real simple. It's confidence in God's word. And you guys remember how we build that confidence in God's word? You got to hear it over and over and over and over. And we also found out that faith is the evidence of things we cannot see. In other words, if we want to live a life of faith, we have to believe that God has done it even when we can't see it. Let me make this practical. When all you see is sickness, you have to choose to believe that God already provided healing for you through Jesus. He's already set it in motion, even though you don't see it. So you choose to believe God's word over your symptoms. You choose to believe God's word over what the doctor told you. Yet most of us believe the doctor's report over everything else. As if they're some kind of like God or something. Can I fill you all in on something, though? They are practicing medicine. I love doctors. I'm thankful for them. I'm glad that we have them. But never forget, they are practicing medicine. They don't know everything. They never will. All they can do is compare your situation to what's happened to other people in the past. And since most people don't believe God's word for healing, do you really want to be grouped in with, the, with everybody else? I know that I don't. I know all those other people may have died of the same cancer, but that's because they didn't believe God. Come on, we got a testimony in here. But you're different, y'all. You know that cancer is no big deal to God. This is no big deal. Sure, like people may have died from it, but I'm, I'm not, I don't need to be compared with those other people because I believe in God. So I'm going to choose peace and trust that God is working and that the healing power of Jesus will cause my body to be healed of even the worst sickness. There's nothing too big for God. There's nothing too small for God. If you want to live a life of faith, just get ready to be the oddball. Get ready for it. But you're going to be the healthy oddball. That's full of life and joy. Like, that doesn't sound so bad, does it? It's good stuff. Faith is when we praise God, even when we don't feel like it. Faith is when we give, even when it's inconvenient. Faith is why we trust God, even when we don't understand. Faith, that's what faith is. Faith is what enables you to stay at peace in that little gap of time between when you release your faith and you actually see the results of it. Faith keeps you at peace in that gap because you know the result is coming. Just like when you press buy now on Amazon, you know that package is coming. You don't worry. You don't fret. You know it's coming. So you release your faith and you just know that it's coming. And last week, Tim and Darla brought us a powerful message about speaking our faith. And they taught us something very important. In order to speak your faith, the word of God actually has to be planted deep down on the inside of you. You know, most of us start out the speaking thing, just kind of saying scriptures out loud, hoping that they're true. (laughs) We're kind of hoping, you know, we're just hoping. But at some point it drops down in there and you're like, I'm saying this because I know that it's true. And that's what Tim and Darla were talking about. And this unwavering belief only comes from time with God. You got to spend time with God. The word of God cannot grow deep roots if you don't water the seed that was planted. You can't just, I'm planting seed in you guys right now, but you got to go home and water it. I can't water it for you. You got to do that. And that comes by spending time with God. And the best time to do that is first thing in the morning. Just like Tim said, we got to follow the example of Jesus. When did Jesus do it? First thing in the morning. And sometimes he stayed up all night to pray. Anybody up for that? (laughs) <laughs> so step one, have faith in God. Step two, speak your faith. So now let's talk about removing the doubt. And the Lord's been showing me that this is actually the one thing that's been tripping most of us up. It's what's been blocking the miracles. If you've been trying to walk in faith, but you're not seeing the results of it, like this is the message that you need. Like today's your day. So I want you to extend your faith and just say, I'm going to get the truth that I need today to correct my thinking. I'm just believing for miracles to happen and just our thinking renewed and those, those lies dismissed. It's going to be good stuff. I'm excited. So how many of you have prayed for something and it seemed that God didn't even hear you? Anybody? How many of you have prayed for healing for somebody and then they died? This kind of stuff leaves us confused and then often these negative experiences cause us to abandon our faith. You know, if it didn't work that time, then it's not going to work this time. Now you know you're not the only one that thinks that. You're off the hook. We're kind of at a disadvantage here in America, too, because we live in like this era of immediate gratification. We think that God should be just as obsessed with it as we are. Anybody? We want God to answer our prayer when? Now. Like, I mean, if Google can answer my question right now, then surely God can answer my prayer right now. We all know it's true, but kind of when you bring it out into the open, you're like, that's kind of ridiculous that we think that way. But that's just the culture that we live in. We all, want to, we all want to hear that God answers prayers immediately, every time. Wouldn't you guys just love it if I stood up here and told you that today? But I can't tell you that today because I'd be lying to you. God doesn't always answer your prayer like immediately. You don't always see the results of it immediately. And I'm going to show you a story in the Bible that illustrates this. This is a really cool story. 
You'll find out that sometimes it takes time. And this is found in the book of Daniel. And we talk about this guy a lot because he's a great example for us. He kind of lived in a culture that was anti-God, but yet he chose to live his life for God. Seems kind of relevant to today, right? But in Daniel chapter 9, he was praying, and the people of God were kind of in a mess because, well, they were disobeying God, and God gave them a chance to get out of it, and, well, they decided to keep disobeying God, and so they were in trouble. That kind of sounds familiar too, doesn't it? Anyways, Daniel was praying and repenting on behalf of Israel. He was confessing their sins and asking God to have mercy on them, even though they didn't deserve it. Again, that sounds familiar. Anybody been praying and repenting on behalf of America lately? So he was also looking for clarity on a vision that he had, and he was asking God in his prayer, help me understand this vision. And if you read Daniel's prayer, it seemed as if his prayer was about three minutes long. Like if you read it out loud, that's about how long it takes you to read it. And at this point into his prayer, look at what happened next. In Daniel chapter 9, it says, As I was praying, Gabriel, which is an angel, whom I had seen in the earlier vision, came swiftly to me the time of the evening sacrifice. He explained to me, Daniel, I have come here to give you insight and understanding. Cool. Daniel's prayer was answered in about three minutes. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'd rather have it immediately, but I think I can wait three minutes. I mean, we all wait three minutes in the McDonald's drive-thru, right? So at least we can just pull out our phone and check Facebook while we're waiting on God to answer our prayers. Just three minutes. But Daniel's prayer wasn't answered in three minutes. It was actually answered immediately. And you find that out in the next verse. It says, the moment you began praying, a command was given, and now I'm here to tell you what it was, for you are very precious to God. Listen carefully so you can understand the meaning of your vision. When did God answer? The moment he began praying. Then why did it take the angel three minutes to get to Daniel? I don't know. Like maybe he was on the other side of the galaxy and had a ways to travel. Maybe he had to get his toothbrush first, you know, before he came here to earth. But what we do know is that God answered Daniel's prayer immediately. The moment he began praying, God set the answer in motion, but something had to take place in the spiritual realm before it was made manifest in the physical realm. And about now you might be thinking, okay, I can wait three minutes. So from now on, I'm giving God a three-minute deadline whenever I pray. But before you make a three-minute doctrine, we got to go to the very next chapter of Daniel. This year, this is like years later in Daniel's life. So surely he was like more mature in his faith, wouldn't you think? He's probably closer to God. He'd been pursuing God. Therefore, I bet his next prayer is going to be answered even faster. But take a look at what happened. Daniel chapter 10. I, Daniel, had been in mourning for three whole weeks. All that time I'd eaten no rich food, no meat or wine crossed my lips, and I used no fragrant, fragrant lotions until those three weeks had passed. Oh, man, three weeks? Like, and this wasn't even a pleasant three weeks. He was mourning and fasting and seeking God for his answer. You guys know this is a long time. I mean, just listen to people gripe about their two-week quarantine. It feels like forever. How could someone as awesome as Daniel have to wait three weeks for his prayer to be answered? Well, at the end of this three-week period, once again, a messenger from heaven came to answer his prayer. And the messenger even explained why it took three weeks this time. Take a look. So then he said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God. Your request has been heard in heaven. I've come in answer to your prayer. When did God hear his prayer? When he first started praying. Once again, as soon as Daniel prayed, God set the answer in motion, but something had to take place in the spiritual realm before it was made manifest in the physical realm. And last time it took three minutes, this time it took three weeks. Why did it take three weeks? He tells us in the very next verse, but for 21 days, the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael, one of the archangels came to help me and I left him there with the spirit prince of the kingdom of Persia. Ah, there was a fight going on in the spiritual realm. And I imagine it was because the devil got a little bit smarter this time. He's like, oh crap, I wasn't there last time Daniel prayed and he got his answer in three minutes. I'm going to put up a fight this time and make sure he doesn't get it so soon. And this is really interesting. And it's why we all need to be aware of the fact that there is a spiritual realm. And it's actually more real than the physical realm because this realm that we live in was made by the spiritual realm. And in this story though, I can't help but wonder what would have happened if Daniel would have given up during that three week period. What, what if Daniel gave up on God a few days in? I mean, the rest of us would. We'd be like, God, you answered this prayer, this kind of prayer in three minutes last time. It's been three days. I guess I'm just going to have to do this one by myself. That's, how, that's pretty much what all of us would do. If Daniel would have done that, he may not have ever gotten his answer. 
I mean, why would the angel have continued fighting if Daniel wasn't even in faith anymore to receive the answer for his prayer? I think we're all starting to understand why so many prayers seem to go unanswered, because we give up too fast. God has always answered immediately. But we tend to give up before the answer has time to manifest in our physical world. We've taken on this mentality that if I don't see it immediately, God didn't hear me, and I need to pray again. But this is just a lie that the enemy uses to get you out of faith. Now you know better. It doesn't matter how long it takes. God heard me the first time. He heard me. In both of these stories about Daniel, I want you to remember that God answered him as soon as he started praying. As soon as he started praying, but there was a period of time that had to pass before what happened in the spiritual was made manifest in the physical. And that's why we're getting rid of doubt today, because doubt is the thing that keeps you from receiving from God. God has always answered your prayer every time, but you have a tendency to build a wall of doubt. We doing okay, girls? Yeah? Yeah? All right. Doing good. God has always answered your prayer, y'all, every time. He's always answered, but you have a tendency to just build this wall up of doubt, and it keeps his answer from ever getting to you. This isn't God's fault. This isn't God's fault. It's yours. Welcome. You're welcome. It's your fault. But you can fix it by getting rid of doubt. Now, to help us get a better understanding of doubt so that we can easily recognize it and get rid of it, I want to uh, split up doubt into three different categories. And the first one is, go ahead and write this down, ignorance. Sometimes you just don't know. Maybe we should be more politically correct of this and say lack of knowledge. If you don't like that word, ignorance, you can write that down if you'd like. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and some things you just haven't heard yet, right? So you doubt God simply because you don't know something about God. Like, for example, you may have grown up in poverty, so that's all you know. You had no idea that God wants you to have more than enough so that you can be a blessing to those around you. You just, you just didn't know, so you lived in poverty. And the way out of this kind of doubt is simple. You invest more time into hearing the word of God, and I recommend you do it every day. Instead of watching your favorite sitcom at night, maybe spend that 30 minutes hearing the Word of God. (laughs) Kiddos are awesome. They had to get their exercise, that's all. Y'all don't worry. All right, here's the next one. Here's the next kind of doubt, and that's wrong teaching. This is basically the same thing, but it's a bit harder to overcome. It's kind of like if I had a blackboard up here, and it had written over it all kinds of lies. Like, it was just full of lies. Like, Before you can write the truth on it, you're going to have to take time to erase all the lies before you can start writing the truth. So if you've been taught like that God made that God made you sick or that this is punishment for your sin or that God somehow gets glory out of you being sick or being poor, then the antidote's the same. You got to hear the word of God. You're just going to hear to have you're going to have to hear it a whole lot more than the person that just didn't know because you're going to have to undo all that wrong teaching. It's harder to overcome, but you can overcome it. You just got to be diligent and you got to stick with it. Like, I'm not trying to discourage you all, but just know that it's going to take a while and you're going to have to dig in. You're just going to have to do it. You're going to have to scrub the blackboard and you have to get it clean. And when you uncover wrong teaching in your life, just, just get rid of it. You need to get rid of it. Listen to every message on YouTube. Look up every scripture you can. Like if the poverty is a thing that you've been taught that God wants you poor, then you get in the scriptures and you find every scripture about provision. You get on YouTube and you listen to every message you can find about how God wants you to have more than enough. And it'll scrub away that wrong thinking. So these first two types of doubt, ignorance and wrong teaching, they're both overcome by the word of God. And here's the third one, circumstantial doubt. If you pray somebody to be healed, for somebody to be healed and they end up dying you're probably going to think this doesn't work, right? If you've been sick for years and you've been believing God for healing, you're probably going to think this doesn't work. God doesn't want me well. So how do you overcome this kind of doubt? I want to tell you a story about Jesus to help you understand this. And it's in Matthew 17. It says, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. So here we have a father who desperately wants his son to be healed. Like his son was having terrible seizures on a regular basis that threatened his life. Can you imagine what this would be like as a parent? Like, man. And the Gospel of Mark shares this same story in in chapter 9, and it gives us a few more details. This wasn't something that the boy had just recently been dealing with. This is something that that boy had been dealing with like his whole life. This had been going on for a long time. So the father brought the boy to the disciples. They prayed and nothing happened. So there you go. If you prayed for somebody and nothing happened, the disciples did too. 
But Jesus' response to this is pretty straightforward. He, yeah, we're about to find out. And Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Our inability to use the power of God is not cute to God. It offends him. Sometimes we get ourselves caught in this false sense of humility, think, saying things like, you know, I'm just a man. If God wanted to do it, he would, but I'm, I'm, I'm just me. We convince ourselves that this sorry attitude somehow honors God, but it actually offends God because he's like, I gave you power. The same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you, and that's what you do with it? Hmm. No, God wants us to be confident. He wants us healing the sick and casting out demons. Obviously, it's not because we're awesome. It's because God's awesome and his power is working in us. And he never leaves us. He's always with us. So why would we not operate in this power? All right, let's get back to this story. The disciples failed. Jesus cleaned up their mess, right? Thank you, Jesus. And here's what happened next. Then the disciples came to Jesus and privately, they had to wait for the private moment, right? I'm not going to ask in front of people. Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, In other words, you couldn't do it because of your doubt. You didn't believe. And some translations say because of your little faith. And even my favorite translation, the NLT, it says because you don't have enough faith. But sometimes our modern translations get it wrong, even my favorite one. So you always have to compare these translations to the one that's closest to the original language, which is the King James Version or the New King James Version. There you go, Simon. High five. He's been set free today. I knew this church knew something, right? (laughs) But we know that this whole little faith idea is not the correct translation because of what's said in the very next verse. Like, it's really clear. Take a look. For assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So you think that Jesus would say, you couldn't heal him because of your little faith, but if you just have a little faith, like, that, that doesn't even make sense. Why would Jesus say that? So it wasn't because they had little faith. It's because they had what? Doubt and unbelief. Because Jesus wasn't talking about little faith. The reason the disciples couldn't cast out the demon, why? Is because of doubt. And it seems that this was circumstantial doubt. They watched this boy having seizures. When you watch somebody have a seizure, it's it's scary. And so because of that circumstance, because of what they saw... Doubt crept in, and they weren't able to cast the demon out. But here's the interesting thing. The disciples had been casting out demons all the way up until this point. But there was something about this situation, and maybe it was the father too. Maybe he fed the doubt, because the father had been seeing this for years and years and years. Circumstantial doubt. So they asked Jesus why. Jesus gave them the answer, like, how can we cast this demon out? He said, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Most people read this story and think that Jesus was saying this kind of demon only goes out by prayer and fasting. Anybody thought that? But he wasn't just, he wasn't talking about the demon here. He's talking about the doubt. This kind of doubt only goes out by prayer and fasting. So the antidote to circumstantial doubt is prayer and fasting. Y'all are getting excited, aren't you? I mean, everybody loves a good fast. (laughs) Let me tell you why it works this way. Prayer, Prayer moves you closer to God right? When you spend time in prayer, the more aware you are of his presence. If you don't spend time in prayer, you're more aware of your circumstances than you are his presence. And then fasting partners up with prayer and takes us to the next level because when you fast, you become more aware of your physical body and how in control it is of your life so that you can put it in its rightful place. So if you want to make your body upset, y'all just, just fast. I mean, that's how you do that. People will kill and even cannibalize because of hunger, And the reason is, hunger is probably our most strong desire on the inside of us, and it's the easiest one to aggravate. (laughs) Some of y'all can't go four hours without eating, because you get so aggravated. Your body tells you what to eat, when to eat, how much to eat, and you just say, oh yes, body, I will give you what you want. Oh, I don't know. (laughs) So when 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 you fast, your body's crying out, feed me, I'm in control here. And your spirit says, nope, I'm going to believe the word of God. 
over the pain that I feel, the hunger that I feel right now. And your body shouts back, who do you think you are to deny me? You haven't done this in 20 years and you think you can start telling me no now? You say, yep, because the word of God says, I don't live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And your body responds, I'll be dead by noon. I know it. (laughs) I just know it. And so you decide, all right, we'll go two days instead of one. How do you take that? Your body will say, no, you can't. I'll be dead for sure. All right, three days. And about this time, your body realizes it better shut up if it wants to survive this fast. And it's interesting. After about the first or second day, you actually don't even feel the hunger anymore. It just subsides. It's because you have your senses under control and you have your desires under control after that one or two day period. That's what fasting is all about. It helps you remember that your body does not get the last word. God does. He gets the last word. So when, you're, when that symptom shows up in your body again, you laugh because you know God's word is true. Or when you pray for somebody and they get worse, you laugh because you know that God's word is true. The body does not get the last word. God gets the last word. So circumstantial doubt only comes out through prayer and fasting. You got to draw yourself closer to God and you got to show your body who's boss. Are you realizing how God has never been withholding miracles? You've been the one getting in the way. So take every opportunity to hear the word of God. And when you have doubt creep in, that's because of your circumstances. Just take it to the next level. Get into a little bit of prayer and treat your body to a good old fast. It'll thank you later. Since the word of God is what removes doubt, I want to end today by helping you guys overcome some of the most common doubts. So I'm going to share the lie with you, and then I'm going to share the truth with you, and then I'm going to give you three scriptures to back it up. And if you've been, this is on the back of your message notes. You don't have to fill any blanks in here. But as we're going through these, if one of these lies is what you deal with, I just want you to put a big circle around it so that you can take these scriptures, maybe print them off and put them on your mirror, whatever you need to do, and just start reading them every day until that doubt is gone. So here's the first lie. If I'm sick, it must be God's will. The truth is God wants me healed every time. Every time. And here's three scriptures for you. Second Peter 3, 9 says, God does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. And then 1 Peter 2, 24, he personally carried our sins and his body on the cross so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you're healed. And then 3 John 1, 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. That's three of about 200 scriptures that you can find to back this one up. So get in there and start looking them up. Here's the next slide. The devil is more powerful than me. The truth is the devil can't do anything without your cooperation. Let me show you what I mean. James 4, 7. So humble yourselves before God, resist the devil, and he's going to do what? He don't have a choice. He's going to flee. Luke 10, 19. Look, I have given you authority over... All the power of the devil, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Who has the more authority, the devil or you? You. You have all authority over the power of the devil. Though a thousand fall at your side, though 10,000 are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. They may be around you, but they ain't going to touch you. That's God's promise to you. So the only way that the devil can have place in your life is because you gave it to him. You handed over the authority and you said... Here, you can have it. Why don't you all just take it back and say, I have the authority. Shut up. All right, here's the next one. Lie. God uses sickness to teach me. Oh, this is real common. It's nasty. The truth is God rescued me from sickness. You see, Galatians 3.13 says, but Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. See, a lot of people will, will think, you know, it's because of my life of sin that I have this sickness. Nope. Yeah, sure, he did that in the Old Testament. That's the scriptures that they'll use. Well, he, he put the snakes and the Israelites, and they bit him, and they died, and blah, 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 because of their sin. Yeah, that did happen in the Old Testament. But what happened? Christ has rescued you from the what? Cursed, pronounced by the law. So when he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. So that doesn't apply to you. God's not going to make you sick because you sinned, y'all. He doesn't do that. Here's the next one, Mark 2, 8. Jesus asked him, is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, Or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk. So I'll prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. And I love this story. you got to go read the whole story to get the gist of this. But basically, Jesus forgave his sins first, and then he told him to get up and walk. You know, your sin can be the thing that causes you to be sick, like just because of things that happen in the natural world. But we, we think that we have to stay in it because God punishes us 
for that. Nope, he wants to forgive your sin and he wants to heal you. He wants to forgive your sin and he wants to heal you. He'll take care of the root and he'll take care of the problem. Every time. Here's the next one. Mark 16, 17. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. If you can do that for other people, surely he doesn't want that sickness in you either. All right. Here's the next lie. God is glorified whenever I live sick or poor. Man. Pretty common. The truth is God is glorified when I make a difference. John 15, seven, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. Who sick bears much fruit? No, you're grumpy and you're gripey and people don't wanna be around you. He wants you to bear a lot of fruit. That is when God is glorified. In 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him are yes. His answer is always yes and amen. So be it to the glory of God through us. So whenever you operate in the promises of God, he is glorified. That's how we glorified God. In Matthew 5.16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father in heaven. God is glorified when we make a difference. He is not glorified by our sickness. He is not glorified by our poverty. He is glorified whenever we receive his promises and we live in them. So how do you overcome doubt? By hearing the word of God. It's simple. And when doubt is caused by circumstances, you bring in the big guns, prayer and fasting. So to wrap this up today, let me share another story about Jesus. This is found in the eighth chapter of Luke. And Jesus was on the way to heal this 12-year-old girl who was dying. And take a look at what happened on the way. It says that Jesus went with him, the father of the girl. He was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied it, and Peter said, Master, the whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out of me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. And the whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. This woman was healed without Jesus even knowing what was going on. He didn't have to say anything. She didn't have to get his attention first. She was healed by her faith. She reached out and she received the healing. So I've been telling you guys for the last three weeks that God's not withholding miracles. He's waiting on you to step out in faith and receive. And he might be surprised at it like he was with this woman because you hadn't done it yet in your whole life. Oh, look, they finally reached out in faith. <laughs> I felt the healing power go out of me. Now, I believe that some of y'all were able to eliminate doubt today just by simply hearing the word of God because that's how it works. And so if that's you, if you had some doubt that was eliminated today, I just want you to stand up. I want you to lift your hands up to God and just receive your miracle. Amen. Amen. <laughs> God, we praise you and we honor you for your word is truth. You're so faithful. You're so patient. <laughs> Lord, we receive all of your promises. They're yes and amen. If you've believed the lie that God wants you poor, I want you to stand up and reach out your hands. And as you do that, curse is gonna be broken. We break the curse of poverty in Jesus' name. If you believe that God wants to teach you something through your sickness, 
You go ahead and stand up and raise your hands and break that doubt right off of you. Before service today, I kind of had a vision of like, there's just these walls of doubt that we've been building all of our lives and they just crumbled, like instantly crumbled today. And so that's what I believe that has happened for many of us in this room today and even watching online, just those walls of doubt crumble. But the thing is, that doubt tries to creep back in. You may get home and something may hit your brain, a circumstance or a memory of some sort. And what you do is you just, you're simply diligent to that. You're like, nope not going to believe that doubt. Just because you have the doubt doesn't mean that you've sinned, doesn't mean that you've, you've lost what you've asked for. What, what happens is whenever you keep thinking about that doubt over and over and over and over and over and over and over, that's, that's, that's what builds the wall. But if you dismiss those thoughts of doubt as soon as they come up, then it's not going to hinder what God's doing in your life. You can say, nope, I dismiss that doubt and I believe God's word. And you find your scripture that you want to stand on. And the way this has happened for me recently is there's, an, there's a lie that the enemy likes to tell me, and he's told it to me all my life. You're going to die young. I don't know where that comes from. No person has told me that. It's just this thought that kind of like badgers me. And so I finally got tired of dealing with it. It's like, well, look up scriptures for healing. And I'd look up those. I was like, I believe in healing. Like that, that wasn't kind of, that wasn't really meeting the need for me. So I was like, I know what I need to do. I need to look up scriptures about long life and how God has... Uh, equipped me and given me what I need to be uh, here for my family and provide for my family because that, I, don't, I don't fear dying. I fear like leaving my family behind because I, I want to be there for them. And so that's when I found Psalm 128, which is absolutely beautiful. And it basically says that it talks about, it's, it's a great scripture for the men in the room, it talks about how your wife will be fruitful within your home and your kids will be grow like strong olive trees. And it goes on and on and on. It also says you will live to enjoy your grandchildren. And that was a scripture that I got and I grabbed onto. God wants me to live to enjoy my grandchildren. To enjoy my grandchildren, that means I'm not going to be sick when I'm old either. So y'all, whenever those lies are badgering you and hitting you, you just have to go find your scripture. That thing's on my bathroom mirror right now. And anytime I have those doubts, I go read it. And I read it and I read it and I read it until that doubt disappears. I can't do this for y'all. Doubt's kind of like a battle in your mind. And you just got to engage in the battle because you're going to win. You're going to win because you got the word of God. Amen. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you for freedom. We thank you that you've given us everything that we need to overcome doubt. We thank you that as we do, we're going to see signs and wonders. We're going to see miracles. You're going to blow our minds with what you accomplished through our lives. And we honor you when we live by faith. And that's why we want to do this. We want to live by faith. And if you've yet to put your faith in Jesus Christ, that's the step you need to take today. Because you won't be able to have any of this unless you first accept Jesus, because Jesus is what it took for you to be free from your sin, to be given new life, to be connect, reconnected with God before you were far away from God. But because of Jesus, all you do is make a decision. I believe in Jesus and you're drawn up right next to him. All your sins are forgiven. You're washed clean. You're made new and you get eternity in heaven. And that's all done because of the power of Jesus Christ. So if that's something you need to do, you make that decision in your heart. Yes, Jesus, I believe in you. You say it with your mouth. Yes, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you did it. And I believe that I'm free from my sin. I believe that I'm free from the curse. I believe that you are more powerful. You're the greater one. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, if you gave your life to Jesus, there is a journey that's ahead and you need the people of God along with you on that journey. And we want to be those people. We really do. But we can't be those people if you don't let us know. So we set up an easy way for you to tell us. You simply text the word Jesus to 918-373-9883. We would love to go on that journey with you. God's good, huh? The word of God is good. I hope y'all are falling in love with the word of God. You know, if I got to the end of my life and I was like, I led a church that fell in love with the word of God, I'd be like, yes. Because the Word of God is everything. It's what we need. Well, before we leave today, I want to give you an opportunity to extend your faith through giving. 
I don't talk about that a lot, about how sometimes that's a faith journey, but we need to extend our faith through giving. We all understand that to participate in like uh, the stock market, we have to contribute to our 401k or our IRA. And that's a great example of how it works in the kingdom of God. If you want to plug into to kingdom finances, then you got to participate in God's plan by contributing to the kingdom of God. And No, no Limits is a great place for you to just plant that seed and watch it grow into a mighty harvest. And uh, your generosity, it really does make a difference. It enables us to share the gospel here <clears throat> and all around the world, at Mexico, the Philippines. It's making a huge difference. So thank you for your generosity, and thank you for the laughter. She is joyful back there. That is awesome. If you're ready to give today and you're giving by cash or check, just raise your hand. One of our ushers will bring you an offering envelope. Or most of you all give online. You can do that anytime. You go to nolimits.fyi, tap the giving button. That'll get you where you need to go.